making it over here tonight. It's a beautiful space, but it's lovely outside, so it's probably hard to tear yourself away from this nice weather. Um, so my goal today, and please feel free to ask questions at any point, uh, is just to give you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain of what we're looking at as the neurologist evaluating somebody coming in with complaints that sound like they could represent Parkinsonism. So. What are we looking for? Why can't we do a blood test or a scan that will tell you for certain what your diagnosis is? Um, so hopefully I'll shed a little bit of light on how that works. So we define Parkinsonism as really a cluster of physical signs and symptoms. It's not really just one thing. It's um, the combination of signs and symptoms that you come in to the clinic with. And once we identify Parkinsonism, that doesn't tell us exactly what the cause is because there are many potential causes for Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease is just one of them. It's the, probably the most common one, but it's not the only one. And so sometimes we're not able to tell the first time we're meeting somebody what the diagnosis is. And sometimes we have an idea and that might evolve over time um, based on how you do and how you respond to treatment and so on. So Parkinsonism is just describing the clinical syndrome and Parkinson's disease is telling you a specific cause. So it's sort of like um, Parkinsonism is like coffee and Parkinson's disease is Starbucks or something like that. It's like a more specific example of Parkinsonism. So I love coffee, so I had to use that example, but you can think of others. So Parkinsonism um, refers to this cluster of physical signs and uh, the, the mnemonic I learned in medical school was this one, TRAP. So it refers to tremor, rigidity, akinesia, which uh, is a fancy way of saying slowness, po and postural instability. And when Parkinsonism goes on untreated for a long time, or if somebody's been living with Parkinsonism for many years, they might show some of the symptoms that are seen in this cartoon here. Um, to make a diagnosis of Parkinsonism, you have to have the slowness, and that's the only one of these four features that you must have, but you have to have one of the others. So you can have slowness with tremor, or slowness with stiffness, or slowness with balance problems that show up to us as postural instability. Um, and so you, have, you can see right from the bat that you have to have more than one sign on exam. Uh, is that clear so far? Okay, so as you may know, many people with Parkinson's disease and other forms of Parkinsonism never develop tremor. And so um, I think sometimes the term Parkinsonism gets conflated with tremor and it's really not equivalent. If anything, Parkinsonism is referring to the slowness and the specific type of slowness that we see. So when you come in to see one of us in the clinic, we're taking into account not only what we're seeing uh, before us, but also what you're telling us in the history. So as neurologists, we take that history piece very seriously. We wanna spend a lot of time understanding what you first noticed and when, um, what company the symptoms keep and how things have evolved over time. And many times when people come in to see us, they've had symptoms for quite a while, but it might've taken some time to recognize that there was truly something wrong and it wasn't you know, quote unquote normal aging or side effects from a medication or um, many times people, um, Parkinsonism can be unmasked in the setting of a stressor like a hospitalization or a surgery. And so people may think that their symptoms are due to that um, when in fact it was just the stress or the lack of sleep or um, you know, the uh, trying to recover from something that brought out these symptoms that were latent all along. So we take into account how quickly symptoms developed and for most people with Parkinsonism, symptoms develop gradually and slowly over time. Um, and then we also consider, even though they're not part of our definition of Parkinsonism, 
we consider non-motor symptoms that you might have, such as sleep disturbance or fatigue or bowel and bladder changes or mood changes or cognitive changes. So we ask about those and try to identify them early on because they're going to influence uh, the type of diagnosis that we come up with. We also want to consider exposures to toxins and medications, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then family history, which most people with Parkinson's disease don't have a strong family history, but there might be one or two family members. Um, and then many of the things that mimic Parkinson's disease tend not to have a family history of that condition at all. So that might weigh in a little bit to our thinking. We look at the specific pattern of exam findings and, and then most importantly, how somebody does over time. And so that's why seeing somebody once in the office, it might not be possible for us to say for sure what your diagnosis is. And we really need to um, either take a watchful waiting approach or try some medication and see how you respond to that before we can be more certain. So there are a group of conditions called atypical Parkinsonism or atypical Parkinsonian conditions. And they have some features in common. Um, in general, they tend to respond poorly, if at all, to levodopa. And many of you know that levodopa is our gold standard of treatment for Parkinson's disease. Even though we have other choices of medication, it's really the, the best and works um, the most potently with the least amount of side effects. And so um, if we're suspicious of a diagnosis other than Parkinson's disease, we're probably not going to mess around with anything other than levodopa because we want you to have the best chance of benefit with the least risk of side effects. Um, however, if the diagnosis is something other than Parkinson's disease, we might not see much of a response. Um, and then also, some atypical Parkinsonian conditions progress more rapidly than we expect to see in Parkinson's disease. So that is a clue that we need at least two points in time to identify. And then most of these conditions also have additional signs or symptoms that we wouldn't expect to see in Parkinson's disease. So they often go by this term Parkinson's plus, and it's kind of referring to those other symptoms that might emerge um, in the context of a different diagnosis that's mimicking Parkinson's disease. So what if somebody comes in to see us for a tremor? So this person's coming in, this imaginary patient saying, I've got a tremor in one hand and it's gradually getting worse. So right off the bat, the fact that it's gradually getting worse, we know that it's probably not a stroke because that shouldn't gradually get worse over time. That should come on abruptly and not get worse, maybe get a little better. So we're thinking about something progressive potentially and um, we're ratcheting through our potential causes in our mind. And so with a, an asymmetric rest tremor that's worse on one side, that's usually a sign of Parkinson's disease. But there are a couple exceptions. So you can have a rest tremor um, with what's called drug-induced Parkinsonism. And I'll talk a bit more about that. And then to back up, what is a rest tremor? Well, it's a tremor that's in it, it's its most uh, noticeable or the amplitude of the tremor is greatest when you're not doing anything with that limb or that body part. So typically the rest tremor presents in a hand, um, sometimes in a foot. And so the person might notice it when they're sitting and watching TV or um, sitting in church or um, walking or concentrating hard on another task. Um, so we can manipulate those characteristics of the tremor in clinic. We know which things we can do to bring that out and help identify, is this a tremor that's at its worst at rest or not? So we distinguish that from a postural tremor, which is gonna be worse when you hold your hands out, or a kinetic tremor that's worse when you're doing something active with your hands. And the reason that we make that distinction is other diagnoses like essential tremor are more likely to give you an action postural tremor than a rest tremor. So we're thinking about that, we're observing the characteristics of the tremor, we're looking at how it behaves in different conditions in the office and how, you, what observations you're bringing to us about when you notice it at its worst. And so if we see an asymmetric rest tremor, we're thinking, okay, uh, this could represent Parkinson's disease. I wanna make sure I've ruled out the other masqueraders here. So in this context, drug-induced Parkinsonism would be kind of the top of the list. 
So what if the person says the tremor started right after or shortly after they began a new medication for, for their depression? Um, and this is just illustrating a common scenario where uh, somebody might be on a psychiatric medication to help boost the effect of their antidepressant or because of a diagnosis like bipolar disorder or something like that. And this class of medications is notorious for producing symptoms that look for all the world like Parkinson's disease, and there's no way for us to tell that clinically. Um, so what do we do? We, we look at your medication list, not only the meds that you're on right now, but also the meds that you've been on recently. And these include um, a class of medications called antipsychotics or neuroleptics that um, these are the ones I mentioned are used to boost antidepressants or to control mania or symptoms like hallucinations and um, delusions. And these are just a few examples in that class, that things like aripiprazole or olanzapine or risperidone. And then older examples would be medications like Haldol. And so if that's on your med list either now or in the recent past, we cannot make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease because these medications can give you those exact same symptoms. So while they're on board or when they've been present in your brain recently, we have to really uh, exclude that variable. Um, other classes of medications that can give you Parkinsonism include nausea treatments like metoclopramide, which is Reglan, or things that are commonly used in the hospital um, in the short term, like after a surgery, like Compazine or Phenergan. Most people are not on those medications chronically, but occasionally we see that. And then there are some other types of medications, and this is not an exhaustive list, but just some common examples where uh, like a cardiac medication for a heart rhythm called amiodarone can do it, and a medication that we as neurologists might give you to treat seizures, Depakote, that can also cause Parkinsonism. So uh, if we're seeing someone come in with an asymmetric rest tremor that looks quote unquote Parkinsonian, and they have, uh, we want to exclude these possibilities to rule out drug-induced Parkinsonism. So if you do have Parkinsonism, so that would mean that not only do we see this rest tremor, but we're seeing that slowness as well, then we are going to recommend from our standpoint as a neurologist that you try to taper off that medication if possible. Um, now, obviously, if you're on it because, or if your loved one or whomever is on this medication because of a psychiatric diagnosis that they really need that medication for, we don't want to destabilize the mood symptoms. So we have to work together with the psychiatrist to be cautious about that. Um, you know, we, we would prioritize your mood symptom control, but if there's another way to achieve that without using these medications, then we will try to advocate for you to do that. Um, so I guess that's about, it's not that clear, but bottom line is, we can't make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease if there's something in your system that we're giving you that's causing that. Um, and if we can taper it off, we do, but it can take several months before those medications really wash out of your system. And in that time, it might be difficult to be patient because you're um, experiencing these bothersome symptoms that brought you in in the first place. So we have to um, try to be t patient and we tend not to use levodopa until we've given it time off those drugs. Okay, so that's just one example of how um, an alternate diagnosis could cause symptoms that look like Parkinson's with a tremor. Now, sometimes, rarely, essential tremor can be confused with Parkinson's disease, and I think this usually comes from a, a place of wishful thinking <laughs> on the part of the maybe the primary care doctor, for instance, who thinks, um, well, this person is so young, they can't possibly have Parkinson's disease, so it must be essential tremor. Or there's a family history of tremor, so they're thinking, well, essential tremor runs in the family, then it, it must be that. But we're going to circle back to what I told you before, that we're really going to examine the characteristics of the tremor in clinic and see, is it at its worst at rest or is it at its worst with action and posture? And that'll help us make that differentiation. There are some people who have just such a severe tremor that it's very difficult to determine. Um, and so we're going to rely heavily on the presence of other signs like the slowness and the stiffness which we'd expect to see in Parkinson's and not expect to see in essential tremor to help uh, make that distinction. So essential tremor really shouldn't cause quote unquote Parkinsonism, but the tremor itself can be confusing.
So, so this brings me to um, a time where we might employ additional testing. So when we talk about Parkinsonism being a clinical diagnosis, um, I'm trying to think how it feels to hear that from your standpoint because it's so frustrating that we, you, you have to trust our judgment uh, as neurologists or clinicians that we know what we're doing, right? Um, we don't have a, a test that'll come back with a result saying 100% what you have. Um, but there are times where we can't tell for sure whether someone has drug-induced symptoms because we can't safely get them off that antipsychotic medication or their tremor is very um, confusing and it's present with the rest, posture and action, so we can't tell what's going on there. So then we might consider doing a test called a, a DAT scan. So this is what a DAT scan looks like. Um, basically, how it works is you would come into nuclear medicine and get a... Um, a radioisotope, so it's a, it's a um, tagged uh, tracer that's a cocaine analog, actually, but it doesn't give you any, like, euphoria. <laughs> so, no, you know, you, you come in, you get this tracer, uh, we give it time to work in your system and get to your brain, and that molecule binds to the places in your brain that make and store dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical that we all have in our brain that's at lower levels, among people who have Parkinson's disease and other progressive neurologic conditions that mimic Parkinson's, which we'll talk about going forward. Um, but we'd expect those dopamine levels to be normal if your symptoms are the side effect of a medication or if your symptoms are due to essential tremor. So occasionally we will use a scan like this, but it's really just a supplement to what we're able to see by examining you and following you over time. So it's by no means required um, some people ask about it because they've heard about it or read about it, and we try to explain the context in which it's helpful, which is not for everybody. Um, any questions about that? Or Many of you maybe have heard of it, or even maybe some of you have had this scan done. Okay, so moving on. So what if the presenting symptom is not tremor, but rather stiffness and difficulty using one limb, for instance? What else would we as a neurologist be considering in that context? Um, sometimes asymmetric stiffness and slowness can be due to a rare condition called corticobasal syndrome. Has anybody ever heard of that? Uh, it's a kind of unique diagnosis because when we say corticobasal syndrome, we're again describing clinical signs that are not that predictive of what's going on pathologically in the brain. So it's a pretty rare condition. Um, it can be caused by Alzheimer's disease. It can be caused by uh, corticobasal degeneration, um, which is how it got its name. It can be caused by other pathologies in the brain that we can only tell when we're able to examine brain tissue under a microscope, which is usually going to be after someone's passed away. So this is a very difficult diagnosis to make uh, during life, but we can make the diagnosis of the syndrome. And what does that syndrome show? Well, it shows rigidity, not so much tremor, so stiffness and difficulty using one limb. And the difficulty using the limb is not due to weakness, but it's due to trouble with the signals, the um, brain telling the hand what to do. So an example might be that um, the person has trouble like fully opening the hand and it, main it maintains kind of a fisted posture or a funny position of the fingers. And then when we're in the clinic asking you to do these maneuvers that you've all done a million times when you come to see us, it's very difficult to do those. And it's not just because it's slow, but it's like your hand just is not going to cooperate with what your brain's telling it to do. So we do some additional tests. We look for, um, okay, you know, show me how you would use a pair of scissors or a hammer or how you would use a tool. And then if you're not able to demonstrate that, um, motion appropriately, that's called apraxia. And that tells us that something in the higher levels of the processing of the brain is not working correctly. So that's our cortical sign. Some people uh, present with their cortical sign as a language problem, and that's called aphasia. So it might be that 
they have trouble fluently expressing themselves, like I'm going to probably have a few points tonight, <laughs> or um, they have trouble coming up with a word, or maybe their speech has taken on a very monotone characteristic instead of having like normal lilts and expression. So a language problem can be the cortical sign that we see. We might also see some cortical sensory loss. What we mean by that is that you can feel that we're touching one side and then the other, but if we touch both sides at the same time and the person has their eyes closed, they're only going to feel it on the unaffected side. So that's, that's called extinction. So we have these different tests we can do. We can have you close your eyes and put a coin in your hand and bring it to your, try to feel it and tell us what type of coin that is. And so those are ways we test for cortical sensory loss. And then some pe people with this diagnosis will have dementia, meaning that they've had a change from their baseline cognition that's making it difficult to function fully independently. And the dementia tends to be a frontal dementia, um, so it might manifest with some lack of impulse control or um, impulsivity or inappropriate social behavior, um, signs that we as neurologists interpret as uh, signs of frontal lobe dysfunction. So in addition to the cortical signs in this diagnosis, the person would also have to have some motor signs, and that goes back to what we started with, which is the typically rigidity or dystonia of one limb. And sometimes you can have jerky, uh, a jerky tremor called myoclonus that can, oh yeah, we're near the airport, sorry. <laughs> we're hearing a little bit of the um, flight path, I think. So, sorry, the myoclonus can sometimes mimic a tremor and confuse, um, confuse, you know, some of your providers or, you know, might look a little bit like Parkinson's disease, but it really, to us as movement disorder specialists, myoclonus looks different than a rest tremor. We should be able to tell that on exam. And then sometimes we see some eye movement abnormalities. So this is a pretty rare condition that we don't see frequently, but occasionally we do. And um, it's the one thing on this list of uh, diagnoses that I'll talk about tonight that's really asymmetric like Parkinson's disease is, whereas many of the other things that mimic Parkinson's have a little more symmetry to them. So um, here is, this is uh, from YouTube. This isn't any of, our, of you. <laughs> um, this is uh, an example of somebody with corticobasal syndrome and what... I'll just show you the first part of this video. Um, and I would like you to pay attention to the person's right hand. So it's, there's myoclonus here. It's a very, very fast, fine jerky movement that's not so rhythmic like a tremor. Um, but you can see that his right hand's kind of fidgeting with the gown um, in a purposeless kind of way. Um, he's not able to control the movements very well with the right hand. And um, we're not able to hear it, but I mainly want you just to see what that would look like. So these are things that we look for in the clinic. And we would already maybe be suspicious that this person does not have Parkinson's because um, by this point, I'm sure that they would have been tried on some levodopa and maybe not had a great response. So um, that is one example there. So this person got worse and I don't, I'm not going to show you that part because it's uh, not so informative. It's not so, as that disease progresses, it becomes more obvious what it is. Um, but early on it might mimic Parkinson's. And then on the brain scan, um, you see some asymmetric atrophy. So I'll draw your attention here. This is actually the right side of the brain, even though it's our left. And what we're looking at here is that comparing the left side with the right, we see more spinal fluid filling in between the brain tissue folds there. And that just tells us that this part of the brain here has atrophied and it's asymmetric. So we'd expect a person who has um, right-sided atrophy to have left-sided symptoms. And that is one reason if we're suspicious of this diagnosis that we would maybe do an MRI scan where that's not always a part of our normal diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Um, and this is a pretty obvious example. It's not always this obvious. It can be more subtle, especially early on. So um, that is corticobasal syndrome. What if the symptoms bringing you into the neurologist are gait 
predominant. Um, and one way this might be expressed is that a feeling of the feet being kind of glued to the floor or um, that you can't lift them up and you're shuffling and maybe that's uh, predisposing you to some falling. So we're going to look at a couple examples of what can cause that. If we see somebody in clinic and we examine them and their gait problem is really the primary issue out of proportion to any upper body difficulty, so out of proportion to trouble using the hands or change in handwriting or difficulty doing buttons or those kinds of things, we're thinking of this entity called lower body Parkinsonism. And usually when we use that term lower body Parkinsonism, we're referring to something called vascular disease or vascular Parkinsonism that is a condition caused by narrowing of the smallest branches of blood vessels in the brain in the pathways that control movement in our legs. So this problem is not caused by weakness in the legs per se, but again, it's the lack of those signals telling, telling the feet what to do and how to move. And so it requires a lot of effort to overcome that and people have to be very conscious to lift their feet up or they might not even be able to do it no matter how, how hard they try. And then in the differential of this, so I'm on the list of things we think about with a gait problem, is this uh, controversial entity called normal pressure hydrocephalus. So I'll talk a little bit about both of these things. So vascular or lower body Parkinsonism impacts gait more than the upper extremities. It tends to be symmetric. It may still respond to levodopa, but we tend to have to push the dose up quite high to get a response. So we're always gonna start gradually and make sure that you don't have side effects, but we're gonna keep pushing it up and we might get up to 10, 12 pills a day before we give up on it, as long as you're not having side effects. And what we're shooting for there is a better ability for you to, to walk. Um, we're trying to ease that sensation that the feet are glued to the floor or uh, freezing or magnetic. And um, we really do need to get a brain image to make this diagnosis because if we're suspicious of this, we need to demonstrate that there is some vascular change there. Otherwise, we gotta, you know, dig a little deeper and uh, figure out what's going on. So if we do find vascular disease on the brain imaging and we make this diagnosis of vascular Parkinsonism, we wanna use the levodopa to try to help your gait, but we also wanna make sure we're addressing the vascular risk factors that caused this in the first place. So those are things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes. Uh, we would wanna make sure you're on an aspirin or an antiplatelet medication. And we do those things to try to prevent the blood vessels from getting further narrowed or any additional hardening of the arteries. So George H.W. had vascular Parkinsonism and unfortunately you see that it led to him being in a wheelchair. And again, just speaks to the idea that this is uh, predominantly a gait disorder. And what we'd look for on the brain imaging, and this is a, um, a scan, an MRI scan. So we're looking at an axial view again so right side of the brain, left side of the brain. This is deeper than the picture I showed you before, so it's kind of lower down in the brain from where we were before. The spinal fluid um, is made and contained in these structures called the ventricles, and so the spinal fluid looks black on this type of scan, and so you see that fluid there. But then the brain tissue out here is scarred. All this white is abnormal, um, and that all reflects gradual hardening of those narrow blood vessels over time. So this is not what we'd expect to see in someone who's had a stroke that came on right like that. In that case, we tend to see like a wedge-shaped area of tissue that's fed by a bigger blood vessel that's been blocked off, whereas this is a gradual, slow process over time. Um, and it gives you this gait problem. So then moving on to another thing that can look similar on exam is um, this entity called normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is like the bane of the neuro neurologist's existence. Um, and the reason that it's so such a challenge is that there's really no consensus as to how to make this diagnosis. Um, it's, it's defined by this triad of conditions that are pretty common as people age. Um, so some cognitive change, gait disturbance, which also will look magnetic or shuffling or freezing, and um, urinary incontinence, which early on might just look like urinary urgency. So unfortunately, many people develop those symptoms or two or 
one of those symptoms over time and we might, uh, so it's not a very specific um, symptom cluster. And then um, it also implies that there's more spinal fluid in those ventricles than we'd expect to see, but there are other things that happen as we age that can look similar on the brain scan. So it's, it's, there's no gold standard as to how to diagnose this. And there's really uh, problematically no consensus as to how to identify who's going to best respond to a shunting procedure, which is the treatment for this. So um, when you're considering a diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus, you should have kind of specific exam findings that's gonna be mostly the gait problem. And we would tend to do um, a brain scan to look for the patterns that suggest that, but also we do what's called a high volume lumbar puncture. And what we do in that test is we watch the person walk. Uh, we ideally get a video of the person walking. We send them to radiology or to our um, clinic nurse practitioner who does this procedure. They numb up the low back. They withdraw some spinal fluid from between the bones that make your spinal canal. And we want to take off enough volume that we're going to at least temporarily relieve this um, excess of fluid that's putting pressure on the, the brain tissue. So then we watch the person walk after and we should see some improvement that it's easier or faster or much more fluid um, of a gait. And then that might indicate the person would respond to a shunting procedure. And that's a neurosurgical procedure where you're left with an implanted device that drains spinal fluid from the brain into the abdomen. Um, and that device itself is prone to complications and um, can get blocked or infected. So we don't just sign everybody up to see what happens. We really wanna be very thoughtful and cautious about whether you're likely to benefit from this. Um, so here is what uh, the walking might look like in this condition. So you can see why that term magnetic is used because it's as if the feet are magnetized to the floor and they're not able to lift up. So this is different than a typical Parkinsonian gait, which um, in Parkinson's disease, the gait tends to be narrow based with the feet kind of close together. And it can be shuffling because the steps are small, um, but this is a bit wider based to kind of a sliding along the floor. Um, it's not, we tend not to see the lack of arm swing. Sometimes there's actually excessive arm swing because you're trying to you know, maintain that balance. So that is quote unquote, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So the, the other point about that is the normal pressure means that when the spinal tap is done and we measure the opening pressure, uh, it has to be within a normal range. If it's elevated, then we consider that, you know, there's probably a problem causing that higher pressure that um, is causing blockage of uh, spinal fluid reabsorption in the brain. So that is NPH. And th this is what the CT scan might look like. So um, here again is uh, a brain, a normal brain. This is a CT scan. So the skull, the bone looks bright white and the brain tissue looks gray and the spinal fluid looks um, dark. So this is normal. We see the ventricles here, they're visible, but they're not very large. Whereas here you can see how expanded that is. And that the thinking is that this is causing problems because those same areas that we saw bright white on the vascular Parkinson scan are now being kind of stretched. So the reason that the gait looks kind of similar is that it's the same parts of the brain that aren't working right, but it's for a different reason. Everybody okay so far? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So we've considered tremor, we've considered rigidity, we've considered a gait problem. What if the person um, is coming in to see us because they're falling and their primary concern is that P in the trap, postural instability or a balance problem? Um, so sometimes that is the presenting sign, which would be really unusual for regular Parkinson's disease to have falls early on in the course, but it's not impossible, it's just less common. So if we see postural instability early on um, manifesting as early falls, we scratch our heads a little bit and think, I wonder if this is gonna be a different diagnosis such as uh, multiple system atrophy, 
Um, I'll talk briefly about that. Or progressive supranuclear palsy. So these are part of this alphabet soup that, um, that we neurologists are taking into account when we're seeing people. And multiple system atrophy, or MSA, is a shorthand for that. It can look very, very similar to Parkinson's disease. It can even share many of the non-motor features. Uh, it's just that it's going to progress more quickly and it tends to be more symmetric. And we'd be more likely to see early falls or prominent autonomic signs. And when we say autonomic, we mean like blood pressure uh, fluctuations or low blood pressures or um, really a lot of difficulty with urination and bowels. Um, we do see that in Parkinson's, but if it's quite severe, we might think more about MSA. Um, and sometimes MSA causes some skin changes that we don't see in Parkinson's. Whereas progressive super, supranuclear palsy is called by, caused by a different um, protein accumulation in the brain. And so it tends to have a little bit different clinical features. Um, it can look like the corticobasal syndrome that I talked to you about before. But progressive supranuclear palsy classically gives you some eye movement abnormalities that are characteristic. Um, which can include um, difficulty with spontaneous eye movements or difficulty blinking or opening the eyes. So here's an example of one of the signs that we might see in MSA, which is that you can get the, these kind of purplish discoloration of the hands um, or cold feet and hands, and it might look like Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, and we wouldn't really expect to see that in Parkinson's disease, so that's a clue for us. Um, again, the early falls or postural instability can be seen. Uh, we can see some dyskinesia or dystonia affecting the face and mouth, um, which might be involuntary like lip movements or tongue movements. Um, sometimes people get a head posture where it's difficult to hold the head up. So that could be called um, dropped head syndrome or anterocolis where the head is flexed and it's difficult to lift it. Um, we, that's a, a bit of a clue for MSA, or a leaning to one side, which, believe it or not, is actually cause, called Pisa syndrome. Um, you can see that in MSA or PSP. So this is an example of one of these Parkinson's plus diagnoses, and we call it plus because it has these additional features that we wouldn't always uh, expect to see in Parkinson's disease. So um, any questions about that? Okay. So another clue for MSA might be that if we did a brain scan, we can see some, um, you just have to take my word for it, <laughs> that uh, this is an abnormal finding. There's um, kind of a brighter line vertically and horizontally, which is called the hot cross bun sign. Um, it's not that common to see that even when we're pretty confident of the diagnosis, but if you do see it, then you'd be more concerned. Um, so that is that. And then PSP is another uh, example of a condition that can give you more early falls or balance problems and the eye movement abnormalities that I was mentioning. So that the eye movement abnormalities that we see in PSP can include um, decreased blinking so that the eyes get dry and it, you can um, end up looking like you have a little bit of a surprised facial expression because the blinking is decreased and the um, eyes are hard to keep open, so the forehead is activated and wrinkled. Um, and so there's a classic sort of surprised expression that we might see. But, you know, again, none of these things are so specific, but uh, it's all pattern recognition for us. Um, over time, people with PSP tend to get trouble moving the eyes fully up or down, um, but we don't always see that early on, so we can't hang our hat on that sign. Um, and then as opposed to the MSA posture that I talked about with the dropped head, in PSP we tend to get the opposite where it's a little bit more of a um, pulled back uh, head posture. And um, people can have what's called motor recklessness. So the balance is poor, but um, because of the way that the PSP affects the frontal lobes, which those are our... Um, Sort of the frontal lobes are like the angel on our shoulder, like telling us how to behave well. <laughs> so if those are offline, um, you might be a little more likely to get up too quickly and then your balance is poor, so that results in more falls. Um, and we also can see some trouble swallowing and a change in the 
quality of the voice. Um, Dudley Moore had PSP. Um, dystonia? Yes, dystonia. So um, let me go back and just put that in context for you. Let me see where am I seeing that. Upper right. Okay, dystonia is uh, activation of the muscles in um, an sort of unproductive or maladaptive way. So when I use it here, I'm talking about the neck muscles are tight and they're pulling the head back when you don't want it to do that. So dystonia is um, activation of muscles that normally oppose each other working at the same time. And so it makes it hard. Um, if it's affecting your neck muscles, it can make it hard to turn or um, maintain a normal head posture. If it's affecting your hand, it might make it hard to open the hand or to use the hand. So um, dystonia is kind of a sign or a symptom like tremor. You can see it in a lot of different things. It's, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so um, there's a little, I don't want to show you this whole video, but there's a little bit um, just seeing how he uh, moves in this video, I think is interesting. Let me see if I can get out of there. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Um, okay, so we don't need to listen to Barbara, but so he has some trouble um, with his balance, so he's using a cane here. And um, I mean, it might be a little hard to appreciate here, but his facial expression is a little more stiff and fixed. And um, if you're interested in looking at this whole thing, it's just about nine or 10 minutes long and it is on YouTube as well. But um, I think it's a little hard to pick up because it's the volume is quiet, but he has a speech, um, kind of a strained quality to the speech, I would say. That's the dysarthria that's characteristic of, of PSP. And then this is, um, I don't know if it's gonna play, okay. This is just from a, uh, also from YouTube, but um, from a textbook. Um, and this is, you know, much more obvious than what we typically see in the clinic. Oh, these are old videos. I apologize. I mean, I'm hoping these people gave consent, obviously, to be videotaped. But um, so there's trouble kind of orienting to get appropriately into the chair. But this is kind of a more obvious example. We don't, it's not always gonna be that um, obvious to us in clinic early on. Oh boy, this is a busy one. I don't want you guys to get bogged down. This is more made for the residents, but it shows us that, okay, we have some different examples of things that can cause Parkinsonism. We have Parkinson's disease, MSA, PSP, and that corticobasal syndrome I told you about. And then we consider all these aspects of it and how they might differ and we're kind of doing that automatically in our head in clinic and trying to assess and, and, and put things higher or lower down on our list of suspicions. What is um, so that is problems with blood pressure, bowel and bladder function, um, temperature regulation. Okay. All right. I'm just, you guys are all getting like a degree in neurology tonight. Okay. So, um, Let's circle back to James Parkinson and his first description of Parkinson's disease because he described the physical or motor symptoms that we talked about right at the beginning, the tremor, the rigidity, the akinesia or bradykinesia and the postural instability. And he made a comment that we've um, come to revise over time, which is that the senses and intellects are, are uninjured. So we know that that's not 100% true. Um, the senses and intellect can be affected by Parkinson's disease but if they're affected to a greater degree than we expect, we might consider a different diagnosis. So um, what if someone um, is brought in, you know, dragged in by their spouse <laughs> in this case, because that's what happens sometimes for our um, patients who are having more of a cognitive presentation. Um, and the description is that there's times where the person is kind of staring off and doesn't seem to be fully present. So changes in countenance, that's a description that someone gave me one time. 
So we can see these so-called fluctuations in a condition called dementia with Lewy bodies. It's very, very similar in many respects to Parkinson's disease. Um, but we would tend to see more of these fluctuations that look like um, either variability hour to hour in the day with the clarity of somebody's thinking, or a lot of times sleeping during the day despite adequate sleep at night, or um, trouble arousing the person. So if we're eliciting these um, things in the history, we consider that to be maybe fluctuations, and obviously we want to make sure there isn't a sleep disorder or some other reason, uh, but this can be a clue about Lewy body dementia. So another thing in Lewy body dementia is that there's hallucinations, but the problem is 66% of Parkinson's patients also will have hallucinations over the course of their Parkinson's disease. So again, it's not um, a black or white thing. It's sort of like taking the whole picture into account and consideration and thinking about that. Um, so there are some famous people who have had Lewy body dementia or still do, um, Ted Turner being the latest study that I've heard about. And um, we now recognize, and I think Robin Williams is unfortunately an example of this, that uh, depression and anxiety can be an early symptom that's part of the disease. And, you know, because depression is not a specific, you know, it's common condition, we can't say, look at somebody who's been diagnosed with depression and always judge that they're going to go on to get Lewy body dementia. But looking back, that's often something people have been struggling with. Um, and we obviously want to be aggressive about treating that. Um, but to make a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies, you have to have dementia, which is meaning that you've had a change in your thinking and memory, and it's affecting your ability to be independent. So that's what dementia means. It doesn't, um, Alzheimer's disease is one kind of dementia, but there are many others. And uh, when we use that term, we're meaning that the person, is, because of a change in their thinking or memory or language, they are relying on family or friends or caregivers to help with some basic tasks like managing meds or preparing meals or arranging transportation or things that we all do in our normal day. So um, you have to have that piece and, if, and then you also have to have fluctuations, uh, visual hallucinations, Parkinsonism or some combination of those things. And then other features that we see in Lewy body dementia include um, RBD, which stands, <laughs> these acronyms, I'm so sorry. You, uh, I should have made a glossary. Um, REM sleep behavior disorder, which is acting out the dreams, talking in the sleep. Um, we see that in Parkinson's disease. You can see it in MSA, but you can also see it in Lewy body dementia. And those three diagnoses share similar pathology in the brain and they can all have REM sleep behavior disorder that might happen decades before a tremor or stiffness or slowness develops. Um, Lewy body dementia sufferers also have what's called neuroleptic sensitivity, meaning that if we give you one of those drugs I talked about before that can cause tremor, um, so a medication for hallucinations, for instance, um, or if someone's in the hospital after a surgery and becomes delirious and gets treated temporarily with something like Haldol, they might develop very severe rigidity um, and become almost like stuck, you know, um, due to the, just a small dose of a medication like that. So that's a hallmark of the diagnosis as well. And then the abnormal dopamine scan refers back to that DAT scan that I showed you uh, earlier that we would expect to see that um, in Lewy body dementia and not in, say, Alzheimer's disease, but We'd expect that DAT scan to be abnormal if you have Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia, so it doesn't help us distinguish between those two. So that's why that test is not always helpful. So these are some other features that we might see in Lewy body dementia, which would be um, fainting because of fluctuations in blood pressure, um, that autonomic dysfunction, again, circling back to bowel bladder changes, blood pressure changes. Um, delusions or depression um, can be present for that. So when we're thinking about uh, how to tell whether someone's more likely to have Parkinson's disease that's you know, affecting their cognition versus Lewy body dementia, well, to be honest, it's kind of a spectrum or a continuum, and we treat the symptoms the same. We call it Lewy body dementia if there's dementia within the first year 
of the motor symptoms. I know this, this is kind of, it's just all these um, diagnostic criteria or are sort of facile to be honest. So it's, it, we can't tell looking at someone what's going on in the brain, but if you have cognition affected early on, we're gonna call it Lewy body dementia. And if it's affected more than a year after you develop some physical symptoms, we're gonna call it Parkinson's disease. So it's, it's a bit arbitrary, but. <clears throat> so we've talked about our four cardinal signs of Parkinsonism, um, the slowness being the thing you have to have, um, and then some mimickers of Parkinson's disease that can present with each of these. So things that can present with tremor or rigidity or the gait changes or the falls. Um, and so it just gives you a sense of how complicated this can be and why um, you have to make sure that you are feeling heard and listened to because we're relying so much on the history and how things have gone over time to make an assessment of what's going on. Um, and of course, you know, we get this question a lot like, why can't you just tell me? And, um, you know, somebody said uh, something really astute last week. We were in a, um, a session for people more recently diagnosed. Um, and someone made a, what floored me as a comment that I never would have guessed, but it made so much sense that having lived through a diagnosis of um, cancer and getting that diagnosis was easier than getting a diagnosis of Parkinsonism because it's so um, nebulous. You know, there's so much uncertainty and it's hard for us to tell you exactly what to expect. And that's gotta be incredibly frustrating. I, I can sympathize with that. But um, when we say that Parkinson's is a clinical diagnosis, it means that you, we're taking all of this into account. We're looking at you. We're looking at how you do with meds, how you do over time. And we're making our best assessment that way. And we have to be humble enough to um, revise the diagnosis over time when we need to do that and say, you know, I, what I thought before might not apply now. Um, and then as specialists, sometimes we're seeing people who have had another diagnosis um, and, you know, we have the benefit of seeing you later. <laughs> so, you know, we, we might look like a little smarter or something, but it's just because <laughs> it's just because the, more time has passed, basically, you know, or we know uh, how you did with the meds that the first doctor tried you on or what have you. So um, that, that is a big part of it. So we don't have one test, one scan that will tell us, but we take all of these things into consideration. And this comes down to how we make a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's. These are the criteria that are used in clinical trials. They're called the um, UK Parkinson's Disease Society Brain Bank criteria. And um, it's really a stepwise algorithm kind of walking through uh, everything that I've just taught you in the last hour. Um, so first, you have to establish that there's Parkinsonism. And so you have to have that bradykinesia, which is the slowness. Um, and then you have to have one other additional thing, which is rigidity, tremor, or postural instability. So once we've established that somebody has Parkinsonism, then we're going to move on and we're going to think about things that rule it out. So if there's a stepwise progression, that's really uncommon because this is a gradually progressive condition, right? So we shouldn't expect to see um, like things plateauing and then all of a sudden getting much worse and then plateauing. That would indicate to us maybe there are small strokes happening. Um, or if somebody has a history of repeated head injury, um, that could mimic these symptoms. As we age, we're less able to buffer the effects of that. Um, if you've had a brain infection or you've been treated with those psychiatric medications I talked about or cerebellar signs, which means that you have trouble with coordination um, and you uh, have trouble with balance as well. So these are all, you know, these are all kind of um, clinical terms that if somebody has these things, we can't make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease because um, this would, these signs would indicate another explanation for their symptoms. Um, and then we move on after we've gone through the exclusion criteria to things that might support our diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Um, most people with what we call idiopathic, meaning we don't know what caused it, Parkinson's disease have some asymmetry. It's going to start on one side of the body and that side of the body tends to always be the more affected side. 
Um, if things are very, very symmetric, we're thinking more about these other diagnoses. The rest tremor is not always present, but when it's there, as long as we know it's not drug-induced, it helps us because drug-induced Parkinsonism Drug-induced Parkinsonism is really one of the only other things that gives you that kind of classic asymmetric rest tremor that gets better when you concentrate or move your hand purposefully. Um, and then if there's gradual progression over time, that would fit with Parkinson's and if that asymmetry remains persistent. And then we hope and what we want to guide you towards is uh, excellent treatment response. So if we get a good result when we use levodopa, um, even if it does cause some side effects, but if it ameliorates your symptoms, uh, then that would be consistent with Parkinson's disease. And then sometimes people who've been treated with medications for several years do develop some wiggly movement or dyskinesia. And um, it's, I feel like that's a dreaded symptom, but when we see it, we're kind of, we don't want to create it, but we know that that means you, you're on the right treatment and the meds are in your system and working. So that's a clue to us as well. Um, and then that levodopa response should remain present for many years. Um, and the progression is slow. So this is a slowly, slowly um, progressive uh, diagnosis when we're talking about Parkinson's disease. And even as far as we've come in medicine and technology, it's still a clinical diagnosis. So, um, you know, I, the uncertainty is so hard to live with, but just understand that seeing you at multiple points in time every, you know, four to six to 12 months is important for us to be accurate and make sure you're on the right treatment. And, you know, again, just make sure that the person you're seeing is somebody that has time to hear what you're experiencing and that you trust them because of how complicated this is. And um, be prepared that your diagnosis and treatment plan can change over time. And that's kind of um, part of a moving target uh, for us. Um, so I think that kind of covers all the things I wanted to share with you, but I'm sure there might be questions and I'm happy to address those. Hmm. So I think hopefully, I think I've, everybody probably heard, but the question is there's a video about CBD or medical marijuana for tremor being very, very effective. And is that legit? And what do we think about that? Um, well, this is a tough question because the bottom line is the jury is still out. We don't have the data to look towards to say, okay, they took a nice, big group of folks and put them on the CBD and a nice group and made those folks get a placebo and we've compared and we've really assessed whether there's any significant risk of side effects or toxicity. Um, those studies are being done currently, but we don't, they aren't published yet. So as providers who are tied to practicing evidence-based medicine and we take that Hippocratic Oath first do no harm, we can't recommend that you <laughs> do that yet. I mean, that being said, like, I, if people tell me they want to try that, um, you know, I just give them some guidance and say, I can't say for sure that it'll be helpful, but, you know, see what you think. And if you don't have side effects, let me know. And I mean, we have to build the evidence base somewhere, but we can't say for sure. And I, I haven't seen the video that you speak of, so I don't know, but I have anecdotally heard that it's helpful to some people for tremor and for anxiety, and we know anxiety uh, amplifies tremor. So whether it's directly quieting the tremor down or just making someone feel so relaxed that they don't have the tremor at that moment, I don't know. We'll hopefully know more soon when those studies are published. Yes, in the back. Um, 
I didn't hear that. <laughs> yes. Medical marijuana. Yes. You're right. The CBD oil has the cannabidiol, but it does not have the THC. Um, so we don't know necessarily what ingredient is the necessary piece of that puzzle. I was reading an article the other day about CBD oil with Parkinsonism, and there are a couple receptors in the brain that it works on. Um, but come, uh, do you want to come up here? <laughs> Not working. Oh wait, there it goes. Um, so it was saying that basically with CBD oil, we don't know exactly what you're getting. We, have, you know, like the FDA is not approved and said this is. In this pill, this is exactly what you're getting. It varies from one, one manufacturer. Pill, which you might buy over the other. Mm. Yeah, that's the challenge with um, anything that's not regulated as a pharmaceutical or a supplement because sometimes we get that question about um, supplements that are intended to help your thinking or memory, but we A, don't know for sure that they work, but B, we don't always know what's in there. Or some people um, prefer to try taking Macuna, um, which is a naturopathic treatment that has levodopa in it. Um, but we're again faced with the fact that from one supplier to the next, we don't know how much is in there or if you're getting the same amount from one dose to another. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that um, you're talking about, um, she was asking about a relatively newly approved medication called Jadago, I think is how you pr um, pronounce it. It's uh, a medication that's in the, a class of medications that we've had for a while, but it's a new um, example in that class. And these are medications that um, allow the dopamine that your brain is making or that we're giving you in the form of levodopa to work in the brain a little longer. So it can be helpful for symptoms for that reason. But again, if we're, um, we are a little more likely to give you kind of a combination of treatments if we are pretty confident we're dealing with Parkinson's disease as the cause of the Parkinsonism. If we're not so sure we're dealing with Parkinson's disease, um, we're seeing some atypical features or we're worried that it's progressing quickly or we want to minimize the risk of any thinking and memory side effects that are more likely to occur with some of these other drugs, then we tend to streamline the meds to levodopa, um, which even though it's one of the oldest, it's really the best thing we have. So um, there are a lot of good treatments, but uh, they, not all of them are appropriate for every patient. The, so the, there was a spot in there that you were explaining it, but I didn't hear the answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so <clears throat> I think you're asking about uh, changes in your speech or um, language. Is that correct? So there are um, sometimes we see what's called aphasia, which means either that you can't produce language or you can't understand language or you can't like repeat something and that can be seen in um, a stroke or um, certain types of dementia. 
including that corticobasal syndrome can have aphasia. Um, many, many people, almost most people I might venture to say with Parkinson's disease have some speech changes that might be like quieter speech or the speech is a little slower. Um, there might be a little word finding pauses, um, but we don't necessarily characterize that as aphasia, even if that, so it's, it's pretty common for um, people dealing with Parkinson's to have noticed that their speech is quieter. Um, maybe they have to repeat themselves more often. Um, and that's where uh, we really rely on our speech therapy colleagues because that can be a helpful way to address that. Yes? Oh. That's correct. So uh, the question was asymmetry being a sign that we look for. Um, and by asymmetry, I do mean exactly what you said, that the symptoms are worse on one side of the body. Even if they're present on both sides, there tends to be one side that's more affected. And that is a feature that we expect to see in Parkinson's disease. Um, but some of these other Diagnoses that we like highlighted tonight don't have that asymmetry as much, um, with corticobasal syndrome being an exception. Um, okay, are, thank you. Are there other uh, symptoms in Parkinson's that point clearly to Parkinson's? We, we've been talking about boys. Uh, there's the handwriting induces, uh, there's the walking, not moving the arms. Are any of those, or are there some that are directly attributable to Parkinson's more than any other? Um, so these are the things that I guess are most suggestive of, um, the fact that we'd be dealing with, you know, bread and butter, we, you know, idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is going to make up the vast majority of the Parkinsonism that we see, um, is that it would start on one side. If you have a rest tremor, that's helpful to us because we think that's pretty specific for Parkinson's disease. Um, if it's gradually getting worse, but it always remains worse on one side of the body, um, we do expect eventually that so symptoms will emerge on the other side of the body as well. And if they never do, that's actually one of the exclusion criteria. Um, so strictly unilateral features from more than three years is pretty unusual. Um, and then a long clinical course for 10, 20 years is what we would expect with a retained response to levodopa. How, many, how high can you go with your levodopa? How high can you go with your levodopa? Um, that's a great question. There's not like a really max dose. Uh, it's dictated by how much you need to control your symptoms adequately without causing side effects. So sometimes we're not able to adequately control the symptoms because we're bumping up against side effects. But as long as we're not um, you know, causing nausea or hallucinations or um, sleepiness or lightheadedness, then we have room to adjust it. Um, and we always wanna stick with the lowest amount you need to control your symptoms well um, because we don't, want, you know, we want to have room to go up in the future. We don't want to put you at risk for side effects, et cetera. So, but I would say, you know, it's a huge range. And for some people, 300 milligrams a day is fine. For other people, you know, right at the beginning, we might get up to 900 because maybe your tremor is more stubborn and we need that much to control the tremor. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you're your uh, prognosis is worse or anything like that. 
Yeah, that's true. So is it not uh, so important what causes it? I mean, the bottom line is at this point in time, we are not able to identify the cause for most people. Um, we know it's a combination of genetic risk factors that we inherit from our family, but then maybe exposures over the course of a lifetime or, um, you know, the, we know that it's not a, ten, it doesn't tend to be a strongly genetic condition, but many people with a diagnosis of Parkinson's have, you know, another family member or aunt or uncle or somebody that tells us, you know, there's probably some genetic predisposition to that. Um, but we don't, we can't tell exactly in an individual sitting before us in the clinic why that person got it. Is Parkinson's related to MS? They're actually um, totally different. So, uh, and we're, that's one diagnosis we can exclude by imaging. So um, even though, I mean, MS can cause symptoms depending on just where in the brain the lesions are. So it's possible it could give you some overlap symptoms, but um, they are not thought to be related. Yes. So the question is, how, like, how do we um, use the DNA tests that are commercially available um, to tell if we're genetically predisposed to Parkinson's? Um, I haven't looked at it. Okay, so my disclaimer would be I really wouldn't recommend doing that for that particular purpose because um, the DNA test, if you want to know your ethnic background or something, you know, by all means, like, <laughs> but if they are only going to test for some of the genetic risk factors of Parkinson's. So it's quite possible that your test would come back saying, good news, you don't carry any of these genetic risk factors, but they haven't tested for everything that is a genetic risk factor for, for Parkinson's. So um, unless in your family you know what gene is responsible um, because somebody else has been tested, um, or you carry one of the very, very rare gene, genes that cause um, dominantly inherited Parkinson's, which a very rare account for a small percentage of patients, um, then the genetic tests that are commercially available are going to be pretty hard to interpret. So they won't really shed much light. I mean, they might get better as we go forward in time. Yeah, so I think I'm gonna, um, is it okay if I restate your question? So I think the question is, how are we, are we assessing um, a response to treatment if the response is subjective? Um, so part of it is that it is subjective and the, these are treatments that are intended to help your symptoms. So if you're coming back to us in clinic and saying, I don't feel any better, then that's a treatment failure as far as I'm concerned. But we want to know why. Like, is it that we haven't gotten the dose high enough yet? Or are you actually responding in some ways that you don't identify? So for instance, um, it's a really common thing for somebody who has uh, a severe tremor, but also has stiffness and slowness, where we might start the medication and the stiffness and slowness improves before the tremor, we make any dent in the tremor. So when we're examining somebody in the office, we're checking the muscle tone and the speed of these movements. And it might seem silly, but we're actually rating the severity of all those things. And so we can generate a score um, based on how severe those signs are, are to us. And it's still somewhat subjective, but it's, 
got a little more objectivity to it. So we might say, oh, well, actually your stiffness and slowness are better even though you still have the tremor and that tremor is stubborn and we need to think about other ways to quiet that down. So some of it is subjective and we can't get away from that when we're using symptomatic treatments because um, the whole point of being on treatment is so that we can keep you functioning and active and doing the things you enjoy doing. If we're not achieving that, then we've got to look, you know, try a little bit harder with our treatment goals. But, um, but underneath that, there is some objectivity that we look for that might not be as obvious. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get into specifics of anyone's treatment because you got to talk, you know, in your appointments about that. But in general, when we're looking for treatment response, we're looking at these signs on exam and how you do over time. And then we're in our mind troubleshooting why you might not have a good treatment response and trying to address those reasons. Not necessarily. There's not really a medication that helps balance. Um, we can indirectly help balance by making sure that you're not too stiff, that your reaction time is as quick as possible so that the movements aren't too slow when you're trying to catch yourself. Um, and we rely really heavily on physical therapy to address balance. Um, and with balance problems, we can't really fix the balance problem, but we can make sure your muscles are strong and that you're flexible and that, you know, you're, we're, we're basically trying to minimize um, the risk to you of that balance problem by addressing everything that's within our control, um, even though we can't directly fix the balance itself. The question was, are weakening muscles a symptom of Parkinson's? Um, not directly, and that's what we as um, your neurologists and providers are trying to prevent. So. Parkinson's doesn't cause weakness per se, but it does cause the stiffness and the slowness. And so if, because you're having that, you're not exercising, you're not active, you're walking less, you're, um, then that causes deconditioning. So we want to use a medication dose and regimen that is going to allow you to move well so that you can stay active, so that you can maintain your strength and flexibility and that you don't lose that unnecessarily. And that's one rationale for starting treatment earlier in the course of a diagnosis as opposed to like waiting until you can't stand it anymore <laughs> because we don't want you to lose ground and develop deconditioning or um, joint problems because you're stiff or um, so we're trying to prevent those unnecessary complications if we can. So the question is about boxing. Um, I would say that some people find it really, really helpful and it addresses something that can be hard for us to address with other forms of exercise, which is the agility. So the fact that you're having to move your feet and react um, quickly to whatever is coming at you. <laughs> or um, So people enjoy the social aspect of those boxing classes, but I would say it's not for everybody. And if that's not your thing or it's not safe for you to do that, it, you're not, there, every single kind of exercise that's been studied in Parkinson's has been helpful. So you just have to find something you enjoy doing basically. Um, so whether it's tango or yoga or strengthening, stretching, I mean, ideally we like your exercise regimen to address, you know, multiple things, but um, you don't have to do one type of exercise even if that's like the more popular thing now. And, um, yes. Uh, yeah, so they're videotaping us, and um, I don't know how long it will take, but ultimately it'll be on the Moving Forward UW Health. So you can either just Google Moving Forward UW Health, or we can give you the link, which I don't know by heart. Um, and it will. there's a way you can click on past uh, topics, and then you can you know scroll through 
multiple talks over the past couple of years since we started doing the video taping. It's uwhealth.org backslash moving forward. Ah, see, Addie knows it by heart. <laughs> uwhealth.org backslash moving forward. <laughs> Is there a test that uses the middle brain? We um, look at different structures within the brain on the MRI, and um, there are ways to actually measure the dimensions of different brain structures, which I would say is not done as part of a routine radiology reading of a scan, but can be done um, if we're, you know, we usually work closely with the radiologist and we're going to get a better read from them if we tell them what we're worried about. So they can look for certain signs um, on the imaging that way. So the, the midbrain would be evaluated with an MRI. And uh, especially the um, profile view, which I think is, sorry, don't get dizzy. Um, so like when we're looking at this, is called a sagittal view so you know this is the back of somebody's head and the the nose here and um so this is the midbrain <clears throat> and um this is the midbrain here too so okay all right okay thank you guys thank you.